Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. Every week, I'm talking to thought leaders around the world who are knee deep in their work tackling some of the most difficult problems, chronic problems, large and small, and they still think the future is bright for us all. Well, we need to know what they see We need to know what they know about getting around obstacles, and we need to know how they find opportunity in almost every setback. So I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, founder of Ever Widening Circles, a constellation of four platforms all aimed at shining a light on insight and innovation going uncelebrated. And in my work, um, I've been having conversations with thought leaders who are um, doing the most extraordinary work in the world. And along the way, those conversations were never being recorded. So about one year ago, in October of 2020, during the pandemic, we started the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast to share the um, wonderful point of view that I was getting from all these people solving problems. And now we share it with you. Today, we're going to meet Donna Cameron, author of a book called A Year of Living Kindly. This is a thought for our times. When um, all we see around us on social media is um, the negativity and the danger and disorder that's rising to the top. Now, mind you, I don't happen to believe that's a full picture of the world. But in an uh, an environment where all this negativity is, uh, all the chaos and noise is in our lives, we need people like Donna Cameron to share her insights with us. She spent a year living kindly. So welcome, Donna. Thank you, Linda. It's so good to be with you. Oh, I, I just, um, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Donna and I had a, had a brief conversation a few weeks ago to kind of plan what she's uniquely built to contribute. (laughs) That's my new wording. Um, By the time this podcast is broadcast, we will have brought all the um, platforms that we've been using at Ever Widening Circles to share goodness and progress. We will have brought them all underneath a new platform called the Goodness Exchange. So the, the, the thrust of the Goodness Exchange is to use the insights of people like you and all the people we've written about at Ever Widening Circles to help everybody else find their role in the conspiracy of goodness of our, of our times, their role, what they're uniquely built to contribute to progress and possibility for us all. So I know you're going to share so many things with us in that direction. So why don't you start Donna by just telling us how somebody comes to write a book called, or, or comes to making the commitment to live a year kindly. Well, I've always been drawn to, to kind people and felt, like I could do better. Uh, It's not that I wasn't a kind person. I I wasn't a nice person, but I think I settled for nice. And, um, and I had been around a lot of kindness in my life and wanted to, wanted to see more in, in my life. So I did declare 2015, a year of living kindly. And my intent was to make a deep dive into kindness, not just trying to live more kindly, which of course was was a major intent, but trying to understand kindness. I'm sort of nerdy. So I love research. And I had noticed that there's been in, just in recent years, a lot of studies about kindness, about the, the benefits of kindness, the physiological and uh, sociological benefits coming out of major universities and, and, um, um, psychologists and doctors. So I wanted to share that too. I created a blog, uh, partly to help to hold my feet to the to the fire. So I would uh, continue with the intention of, of living kindly for a year, but also to invite friends I knew who who I thought would be interested in kindness to share the journey with me. And it was just a wonderful experience. Uh, We had great conversations about kindness and wonderful interaction with people who who themselves wanted to see a kinder world. Um, I guess at the outset, I wanna make it clear that even after a year or now six years of of focusing on kindness, I'm not a paragon of kindness and and I never will be. I'm I'm not Mother Teresa and I'm not the Dalai Lama. I still slip occasionally. I still 
miss opportunities to extend a kindness, or maybe I'm oblivious to a kindness around me. But it really has been a, an extraordinary experience of, um, of, of change. Uh, I, I experience so much more kindness in my life now, and I see so much more kindness too. Mm. So uh, what started out as a one-year sort of research and experiential uh, study has become a path that I want to walk for as long as I'm on the planet. All right. Well, this is a path that we want you to share with us because I'm sure you've picked up all kinds of insights along the way. And, and while we all could use a whole year of living kindly, I would love for us, for you to take us from A to Z so that we don't have to trudge along as quite as, uh, as rigorously as you probably did. You know, one of the things that you just mentioned that is so important is that what we give our attention to expands. Talk to us about that. Give us a little bit more information about that part of the journey of giving, living a year kindly. Oh, it, well, that's so true. Um, what we pay attention to, it, you know, it's like which wolf do you feed in that old, the, that old parable of uh, the good wolf and the bad wolf. Um, I worked in nonprofits for many, many years, had a wonderful career working with people who, who volunteered for nonprofit organizations. Uh, and as volunteers, they weren't doing it for the money, they were doing it for the cause or the, uh, the, the maybe it was to give back to their profession. Uh, and they were just wonderful people. But I noticed that there were certain people and they were still lovely, lovely people, but there were certain people who really spent a lot of time looking for what's wrong. And I think we all know people like this, you know, maybe people in our families or in our lives, people who are just really good at playing gotcha with life. I, I call it um, listening for the missed note rather than listening to the music. And, um, you know, they're the ones who, when the newsletter comes out, call and say, you know, there's a typo on page 11, or maybe they, um, going to a restaurant, they'll point out the typo in the menu, or um, their kid mows the lawn and uh, they miss a patch. And instead of appreciating the fact that your kid mowed your lawn, they, uh, they point out what they didn't do right. And they just get better and better at seeing what's wrong. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be that sort of a person. And, and I saw that it works the other way, too. If we see what's right, we get better and better at seeing it and we see it more and more. So what we look for really is what we what we find. Now, saying that, I don't want it to sound like we should overlook injustice or, or bias or intolerance. But I think we need to pay attention to what, what, we, what we notice and decide what matters. You know, does the typo matter or does the fact that this person is being treated unjustly? Um, so it's really a, a matter of what, who you wanna be and what you wanna look for in, in life. And that's what you're gonna find. Mm. Okay. So if I want to just own it, if people are seeing me looking down, it's because I'm already taking notes furiously. Um, you're reminding me of so many things that other thought leaders have also brought to the table. There seems to be a common thread evolving. Um, and, and many listeners will know that I talk about the, the current conspiracy of goodness. I love that quiet wave of goodness and progress that's happening that almost no one knows about. And, um, and you've already just in the first five minutes of this conversation mentioned three things that I, that I keep hearing over and over again. And that usually means it's about to bubble up to the surface. So let's take those three apart. We've already talked about what we give our attention to expands. So um, while we could give our attention to injustice, we can give our attention to the solutions to that, that problem just as well, just as earnestly. And I really love the solution people in this world. Um, the second thing you said um, is uh, how folk, people tend to focus on what's wrong with the world. And you and I talked about a man named DeWitt Jones, 
who mm -hmm. has an amazing TED talk that I am surprised everyone in the world hasn't seen and celebrated yet. Um, DeWitt Jones and his TED talk called Celebrate What's Right with the World. Talk to me about this, th these notions that this year of living kindly brought up for you. Oh, you're so right. And the DeWitt Jones TED Talk is wonderful. I, I actually have seen him um, in person present a talk very much like that and combined with his view of the world and the photographs that he shares, it's just breathtaking. Um, you know, it's just a matter of choosing who you want to be. And that requires thinking about who, who we want to be. And, and a lot of us don't take the time to think about that. I think if we think about the world we want to live in and then realize that in order to get to that world, we need to model those behaviors, uh, the positivity, the, um, the compassion, the empathy, all of those things are choices we make. And every day we have a choice in every interaction of who we want to be and what sort of a world we want to promulgate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that, uh, that leads me to something that keeps bubbling up to the surface. I'm seeing the term legacy a lot here and there. I don't think people have been talking about legacy for decades and decades, except in the scope of how it works out for old people. <laughs> but I wonder about what a world would look like if we taught the six-year-olds to think about what their legacy was for today. That's Did they wonderful. help everyone in the classroom? Did they clean the, the, the blackboard? Did they leave the room a total mess because they had a temper tantrum? I mean, what if, you know, what, what if we all thought about, got in bed at night and thought, no, I did a lot of stuff today. What, what was my legacy? Talk to me about how this kindness, this year of acting kindly um, will, will change the the legacy that you're li living donna uh what, what you said just reminded me of a book by david brooks and I'm, the title is uh, is escaping me but he talks about the difference between legacy um legacy virtues and um resume virtues and he said he admitted that for most of his life he posted focused on those resume skills, those resume virtues of, you know, being a good reporter, being, um, you know, being good at his job. And, uh, you know, if we think about it, I think a lot of us, especially during our peak career years, we focus on our job, whether whatever that is, whether it's air conditioning units or writing code or, you know, selling cars. Um, but that's not our legacy. It's really the attitude and intention we bring to that job. Um, I remember uh, it was actually during my, my year of, of um, focusing on kindness. We went to a neighbor's um, memorial service. He had died quite suddenly. And all of the people who got up to speak they didn't talk about the fact that he was you know, a successful businessman and he had um, built several businesses and all of this. They talked about the fact that he mentored young people, that he took his grandchildren fishing, that he was, he was a great storyteller, that he just was such a kind neighbor. And, you know, that's, that's our legacy. Nobody talks about, nobody gets up and talks about boy, this guy really knew it, knew how to do an Excel um, spreadsheet. They talk about how you touch lives. So, you know, personally, I hope, I hope my book is touching lives. I hope when I talk to people, I'm helping them think about the choices they're making, maybe helping them develop some skills for, um, for living kindly they're really easy or they're really simple skills but not necessarily easy uh but i think you know we choose who we want to be and if we consistently live that uh that's our legacy yeah well one of the things that i dashed down uh, real quick and I, um, I looked up is that that book that you're referring to by david brooks is called the second mountain okay Okay. I've read it myself. And I tell you, um, 
if I had had such a book and heard such a life story um, at age 35, I think I would have lived differently. He is, if you, if for folks who don't know who David Brooks is, uh, on the, in the world of um, public television, he is the, the conservative commentator for the nightly news, for um, what's the public, the PBS nightly news. It's the news hour, it's called the news hour. Oh, so. And David Brooks has been a New York Times He's as high as you can get in the world of journalism, period. And he gave a lot of his life away to that. Would you agree that that's kind of the gist of his book? Yeah. He lost yeah. his marriage. He lost his relationships with his children, all in the pursuit of a legacy that was focusing on exactly what Donna mentioned. Um, you know, a legacy. No one, <laughs> no one cares about how many Pulitzer Prizes you won or your, your, all your resume at the end of life, what they're going to tell are, are the stories about how you touch them personally. And um, so anyway, that is a good book to read if you want to um, want to improve the path you're on in a way that can whew, take you in an entirely different direction. But yeah, okay. So let's take the next point that I wrote down um, back when, when you were doing this great synopsis a few minutes ago. Another top point I wrote down is that um, this, this journey of kindness, it can become so personal that um, we can't measure it by anybody else's standards. I, I, think it, I think what you're saying is, you know, you, you are better than the, than the version of you before you started this and you still got miles to go, but you are, it, it's in the moment. You, you can have pride in the moment that you chose to, to act with a lot more kindness than you ordinarily would have. Talk to us about this. Um, being kinder than you need to be. That's always my advice to people. Be kinder than you need to be because everybody thinks they're kind. But if you say be kinder than you need to be, then yeah. everybody starts at their own set point. Yeah. So talk to me about how that affects you. Years ago, there was a, a local theologian. He was a columnist for the Seattle Times and a, a speaker and a gentleman I had the pleasure of knowing. His name was Dale Turner. And when he spoke, he handed out little cards that just said, extend yourself. Mm -hmm. Just those two words on them. And I've actually had one of those cards in my wallet for nearly 30 years now since, since I first met Dale. And I now, when I go out and speak, I, I have those cards and I hand them out. And I think that's really what it is, the being kinder than you need to be. Um, it's, it's extending yourself. It's doing more than the expected. You know, I, I often um, differentiate between nice and kind. And for a lot of people, they're similar. The, it's just sort of a semantic difference. But I see kind as, as more of a verb. It's doing something. It's um, interacting in a way where you're not making a judgment about that person, where you're not um, thinking about what, I, what will I get out of this interaction. And all of those things are more than one has to do. And they're focusing on the other person, um, hoping that they will be getting what they need out of the interaction. It's, you know, it's, it's a very subtle difference, but it's, it's a huge difference nonetheless. It's um, interacting without judgment and interacting without impatience, uh, interacting in such a way that um, the other person feels listened to and, and, and heard and, and cared about. Um, and most of the things, most of kindnesses, you know, when I talk with groups about kindness, sometimes people will come up to me afterwards and say, I think I do settle for nice most of the time. Um, I'd like to be kinder, but I'm so busy. I just, I have such a busy life, a busy career. I don't have any time. I don't have extra money. And you can be kind without having to, you know, endow the wing of a hospital or donate lots of money somewhere or sign up to be a VISTA volunteer. You can be kind by slowing down and letting a car merge under the highway or by um, you know, greeting all your coworkers in the office or, or you know, thanking the cashier and telling them they did a great job. Just all of these little things that sometimes seem so puny 
that we think, oh, it won't make any difference if I do that. But it will. It really does. Yes. I guess you and I are just mavens. We, we're just going to keep swapping and laying books on people. <laughs> but what you're talking about reminds me of a, a great book and a great person for people to study. It's a book called Day One. Um, and it's, it, it's an amazing um, synopsis of how if we could go along every day, thinking about like, as if, remember how you are on your first day on the job, you have no judgment about any of your team members. You're just open to yeah. however anybody is and you're learning and you're searching for your role and things and how you can be helpful because you want to impress. And, and, and this, author's, um, this author's premise was that what if we could treat every interaction, every conversation, every day like it was day one? And he tells a great story of giving a, a compliment to a, a cashier on a day in the middle of the pandemic that was just crazy and Everybody was being not kind to each other, and um, he could. He had a, a follow-up story that he changed her life. I mean, we have the potential. Yes, we do. Have these moments. Tell me some stories of this. One of the things I wanted you to do. I, I'm sure you have stories of people who make a choice to be kind, and things shift. Do you have a few stories to share with us? Yeah. Um... I, I did something back at the beginning of 2015 that I'm ever grateful for. I signed up for daily Google alerts um, okay. for the word kindness. So every day at 4 p.m., I get a Google alert of all the news stories around the world that are about kindness. And so many of them are, the, are small things that will never, ever make the national news. But I've got a collection now of some just incredibly lovely stories. Um, there's one about um, firefighters actually here in my own state of, of Washington in, in our state capital in Olympia, who responded to a call about a man who had a heart attack while he was mowing his lawn on a, on a hot summer day. And so the paramedics attended to him and they rushed him off to the hospital. And then several of the firemen stayed back and they finished mowing his lawn and then they cleaned up the yard. Uh, and, you know, that's an example of they didn't have to do that. Nobody would have thought a thing about it if they hadn't. Right. Uh, but they did. It's that what you were saying, doing more than you have to do. Mm -hmm. There's another story about... Um, uh, I think she was a 13 year old girl in Kentucky who saw a boy being bullied on the on the playground because of the tattered shoes he was wearing. So she ran home to her closet and got a brand new pair of Nikes and brought them back and gave them to him. She didn't have to do that. Um, and then one of my favorite stories, and I, I often I tear up when I tell it just because it's just so beautiful. Um, there were um, in Manchester, England, some officers responded to a call for help from a local woman, a very elderly woman. Um, and they responded thinking that maybe she or her husband, who was even older and in his 90s, had fallen or somehow injured themselves. But when they got there, it, they discovered that this couple was just lonely. They hadn't had any interaction for a while. They were, they were scared about the news they were hearing. And so the officers put the, the kettle on to brew and sat down and, and spent the afternoon with them over tea. You know, these are all just, just stories of um, people doing more than they have to do. Um, choosing to go that extra mile because of who they are and because of, of you know, the world they want to, pr to promote. Um, so they're kind and they're caring and they're also brave because it, it takes courage to do, to do some of these things. So I, I get stories like this every day on my Google alert and it's just like a little vitamin every afternoon. I love this idea. This is such a great practical tip. Uh, Brittany, our producer, is listening in here, and I am going to so spread the word on this practical tip. This is one of the most important little <laughs> nuggets of here's how you do it, because people are always asking me, you know, how do you know that the world is such an amazing place? How do you know? Um, well, <laughs> what you seek expands, and I teach people that, and if what would I, what I'm in my mind's eye, Donna, I'm going, what would our algorithms, how would they change 
if we got that Google alert list that, that you're getting, and that's what we gave our attention to, we would yeah. be literally programming our algorithms to start feeding us things from that perspective. Yeah. This is something, okay. So we're going to, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back with more of this, more of Donna and practical tips. And, oh, she's got some wonderful, I got goosebumps just now. She's got some wonderful ideas about the health benefits of, of, of kindness that are really empowering. So let's take a quick break. And when we'll come back, uh, we'll continue on this little magical journey to transform a corner of our lives that is sorely neglected here in these times. Okay, let me be back in just a moment. Thanks. Have you been searching for more positivity, for the good things going on in the world instead of the doom and gloom? We've got you covered. Every week, my team is scouring the web for insights and innovation going uncelebrated, so you don't have to. Not puppies in mailbox kind of stories, but real leaps that are just not rising to the top of our feeds. You can subscribe to a newsletter to stay updated on all the goodness and everything we find this week worth celebrating and have inspiring articles and podcast episodes like this one that give you one aha moment after another. Yes, there is such a thing as finding joy and wonder in your inbox. Go to Ever Widening Circles, that's ewc.co, and you will find a world you can celebrate again. It's time to get a spring in your step about all that's happening and all that is possible. Okay, we're back. So Donna, um, uh, thanks for being such a ray of sunshine in all our day today. I hope people will review, 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 review this podcast for us episode because that's what gets podcasts out into the world. All you have to do is take a quick second to review it and we can get Donna's message and her the, the, the things that she's sharing with us out into the wider world. And that changes everything for anyone who it drops on. So Donna, let's continue. Okay, so let, 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 I'm sure you've got a million stories. Don't hesitate to add them because those are making me so happy. Um, why don't you tell us about the health benefits of kindness that your research found? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, it, it's just been in the last 10 or 15 years that people scientists have been looking at this seriously. I think before that people thought of kindness as sort of a, a fluffy, sounds good thing, but not, not measurable in any way. But now there is a lot of scientific evidence that uh, kindness has some, some real health benefits. Um, and I, I did send you some links to some of these studies that I think you're going to put in the, in the show notes. Um, so I'm not going to say what what university and things but uh it's been shown that kindness produces in us the hormone oxytocin and also serotonin when we um experience kindness whether we extend a kindness we're on the receiving end of a kindness even if we only witness someone being kind to someone else uh, that those hormones are produced in us and they lower our blood pressure they reduce inflammation they fight heart disease and slow aging um, they also reduce chronic pain uh, and reduce depression while also increasing our happiness so you know, it's like a, a wonder drug. And, uh, and there's lots of evidence about this now. It's not just anecdotal. It's, uh, it's been proven. So, you know, if, if you want to be healthier, if you want to sleep better, it's been shown that kindness helps people sleep better. So everything that, that Donna is referring to in detail and many more are going to be in the show notes there. This um, episode will become an article on ever widening circles or the goodness exchange. Um, and you will be able to get links to every one of those articles and find out more about that, those health connections. It's really quite extraordinary. And she did send me quite a list. Um, so let's turn our attention to our working lives, Donna, because what I'm seeing at the goodness exchange, part of our, our mission and vision, what, we, what problem we solve for people is about giving people all these examples of others who have found their purpose, but they're uniquely built to contribute to the world, large and small. There's the guy who's filling potholes in India and saving thousands of lives all on his own. 
I'm sure you know countless stories about people with this Google um, alert that you've got. You probably know stories of countless people who have found what they're uniquely built to contribute and how it re relates to kindness in our working lives. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, you know, it's interesting, Linda, when I got into the business world, it was in the 80s. And at that time, there was this flurry of business books with titles like um, Nice Guys Finish Last, Winning Through Intimidation, Looking Out for Number One. And the, they promoted the notion that to be successful in business, you had to be ruthless. And to the successful businesses had to be cutthroat. Um, and a lot of my very first boss bought into this and he was just a terror. He was a bully and um, he didn't last long and neither did his company. But uh, fortunately, that proved to be incorrect. And we now have evidence that it, just the opposite is true, that the most successful companies tend to be the ones with kind business cultures. And the most successful executives tend to be the ones who are kind and who foster an environment of trust and empathy and, and, um, and compassion. Uh, so Again, there's a lot of research. Um, surprisingly, if you if you look on Forbes magazine, they have done they have I don't know if they've done the research or if they've just published a lot of the research. But there's so much research that I have gotten off of Forbes over the last few years about um, the business case for kindness uh, and. Uh, employees uh, perform at 20% higher levels. The companies tend to be about 17 to 20% more profitable. They're more productive. Uh, they have better customer service, um, far less turnover. Having been a business owner myself for 30 years, I know what it costs when you lose an employee. I mean, the, the loss of, of the the knowledge of the company and the time it takes to rehire and the expense, all of that. So if, um, if being kind can uh, drastically reduce that turnover, you're saving money right there. So it often means the difference between success and failure. Mm -hmm. The other thing a kind business culture does is it creates an atmosphere where people are willing to, I don't want to say risk, but I guess it is in a sense, you know, they're willing to speak out, they're willing to express creative ideas. So innovation flourishes and learning and collaboration, all of those things flourish in a kind culture, where in a, an unkind culture or a punitive culture, people draw in and they're afraid to, to, to do those things that, that really lead to growth and success. Oh, that is, that is a real message for our times, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, for businesses that are just hanging on to reality right now, how about a culture change? How about yeah. getting the employees together and saying, no, we haven't been kind enough to each other and to each other's ideas. And I, I, I just recently um, hired a chief happiness officer. Oh, I love it. Yeah, and I'm finding what her job, and of course, we've sort of invented this position. It's not an HR director. It's an executive level position where um, we're letting this person find our sticky corners or find the pain points. And it's her job to discover employees' pain points and make the workplace happier. Wow, more, that's wonderful. More additive to people's lives than subtractive. That's so I think wonderful. you're right in the wheelhouse there. So um, I want to make sure we have time to get to some of these simple skills and, and practical advice that you've got. I just want to point out, you've got a nice little short um, wrap that you do about how incivility is contagious. We all know that. We see it every day on the internet, on social media. So when people are mean or unkind or harsh, it's, it's contagious. But, um, and there's science to that. It's not necessarily that we're all bad people. Um, but kindness can work the same way. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's true. There's been research. And again, I think I sent you the links in, for the show notes, uh, showing that both are true. So, you know, whether we uh, 
if we experience rudeness or incivility, again, even if we only witness it, we're more likely to be rude in our next encounters. And then kindness is the same. If we experience it, we're more likely to be kind. So that was a huge aha for me. I mean, I think it's sort of an obvious thing, but, but when I saw that it had been scientifically shown, I keep going back to the fact that you know, perhaps because we're also in the midst of this this pandemic and, and thinking about contagions a lot. But I think about the fact that every day we have a choice in every interaction of which contagion we want to spread. Um, so if we go into a store, a meeting, an interaction with family, with neighbors, whatever it is, and just kind of remind ourselves, I'm spreading a contagion here. Which one do I want it to be? Do I want it to be more rudeness and more incivility and mistrust? Or do I want it to be respect and compassion and cooperation? It seems like a no brainer, but you know there are things that get in the way. So sometimes it's not as easy to be kind as we may intend. Okay, so this is huge. I think I might, I, I'm gonna put a star by that little point in our conversation because that is really where the rubber hits the road in our everyday lives, in our business meetings, in those conversations we have with the kids in the car when they don't say the right thing or <laughs> when they don't come home for curfew or what have you. Okay, so you promote some simple skills people can use to, to get into this kindness mindset in the moment. Sure, I think we had three of them that we talked about. There may be many more. Yeah, and there's one that that uh, that I think the biggest one is one that you have promoted, and I saw in your TED talk, and that's the power of the pause. Uh, and I just like you, I can't say enough about how important it is for us to learn to pause. And it should be a really simple thing, but we're raised in sort of a knee-jerk world where if somebody says something rude to us, we say it right back. Or if we feel offended, we, you know, we throw that back. But if we just pause and, and um, think about who we want to be, but also think about, you know, maybe maybe there's something else going on that I don't know. Maybe this person didn't mean for what they said to come out that way. Or maybe there's something happening in their life that really has them on the brink. Um, uh, you know, we don't know everything. And here's a, a, you know, a, a way of um, bringing in another skill, and that's curiosity. Uh, being willing to admit that you don't know everything and maybe there's something else going on. And that curiosity and that pause combined leads us to often to give the benefit of the doubt or to decide, I don't need to respond here. I can, I can remain silent or I can respond with compassion instead of you know, uh, rudeness. Uh, so those two things magically, uh, are, are one of the best uh, gifts of kindness. And they give, us, they give us grace. They give us the gift of grace. Mm -hmm. uh, related to that is withholding judgment. You know, not, the social scientists tell us that we make judgments about people within about three to five seconds of meeting them. So we're making judgments on not a whole lot of, uh, of evidence. You know, it might be how people are dressed or how they're talking or, you know, the fact that they're in our, our way in the dill pickle aisle at the grocery store or something. If we withhold those immediate judgments and again, engage that curiosity, we can give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, we used to have a saying in our company of, um, um, oh, I'm just blanking on my saying, um, we assume one another's good intent. And if we can do that, it changes everything. We assume one another's good intent. And even if we're wrong, you know, if somebody is being malicious, you know, there are some jerks out there and, and that's probably never going to change. But we don't have to be one ourselves. And, uh, you know, if, if we succumb to bad behavior because somebody else uh, initiated it, then bad behavior wins. Um, that is so true. Okay. I, I, I have to, um, give people even more tips. Of course, you and I, here we are, are the mavens, um, 
sending people off in different directions. Here's one thing. I do want to um, have people check out this TED talk I did for a, a group in India called The Power of the Pause. If you just put my name in the search box with The Power of the Pause, you'll come up with this TED talk that has been un, un, um, unpromoted yet because the week after I did that TED talk, um, the, promote, the, the TEDx um, licensee and all his staff started getting COVID. And of course, most of us have heard the trouble with COVID in India has been extraordinary. So there it is sitting there for all the world, the power of the pause, and, and it's a nice little how-to, and it, it dovetails perfectly with her message. Um, another thing I love is um, this assuming the best intention of others. I want to turn people on to a, a um, fabulous episode uh, of this podcast with Dr. Tamsin Woolley Barker where I don't know what you think about this, Donna, but um, she is an evolutionary biologist with, oh. a, with a personal expertise in baboons and ants. Oh. And her whole thesis is she cancels big US corporations because what she's discovered is that humans will self-organize and we're a lot more like ants than we are other primates. Wow. And that in this way um, that we will self-organize to get the job done, 85% of us will totally do that without any systems, we'll just self-organize. But there will always be 15% that are the parasites and the freeloaders. That's what she calls it. In an ant colony, there is always 15% that you just can't count on. And one of the things that I noticed is that in our cultures, in our work cultures, we're always trying to create rules and protect ourselves from that 15% that's not going to do the right thing. And that is to the detriment of all the good that the 85% could bring if we just were kind, we created environments of kindness and allowed their, their self-actualization to just flourish and float yeah. to the top. Yeah, yeah. What you, just, what you just said reminds me of uh, social media where those few voices that are trolls, insiders, spreaders of false information, they get so much play because we click on it. Yeah. And if we would just withhold that, then we would see so much more of the positive news, the, the, the things that make us smile, the things that make us be proud to be human. Um, and, and again, it's really just a matter of what we give our attention to. And with social media, it's really those clicks matter. Even if you're clicking to say you hate what somebody said, you're fueling it. That's right. You, we, if you give things there, your attention, that's all that matters on the internet. Nobody's keeping yeah. track of whether it was good or bad. You just float that to the top. If you click on it, engage with it in any way. Well, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Donna, I have a feeling on the Goodness Exchange, we should create a master course together. Oh, I think that we, that, that your insights, because I only got through half the questions I had today. Oh. Um, and, and I'm looking at the practical advice. We never even touched any of the whole practical advice section. Oh, that's true. We didn't. So, okay. um, so the Goodness Exchange is, is totally built to shine a light on people doing good work in the world like you and inspire others to find their own niche and find their way along this journey of purpose and, and finding what they're uniquely built to contribute. And we are going to continue this dialogue. So look for a time in the future when you see that I've created a master course on kindness with Donna Cameron, and you will be expanded to no end, even past the, uh, the edges of this one conversation. Thank you so much, Donna. Oh, thank you, Dr. Linda. It was such fun. I really enjoyed our conversation. So people are going to want to connect with you. Um, I'm sure we, we, we want to make sure it'll be all over the show notes, this book, A Year of Living Kindly, but where can they connect with you? Where's the best place? Um, my website has a contact me page. It's a year of living kindly.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I have an author page on Facebook. Um, so I'm easy to find. Yeah. And she's a delight to communicate with. So approachable. If you've got something you want to continue further with Donna, uh, please feel free to do this. This, this is a real wonderful guide in this world, um, that needs to elevate to the top. 
So thank you, Donna, for sharing all your insights with us. We're going to do more together. Um, I hope that all the insights you, you heard us share today keep your week moving along in a lovely way. And every day you experience the kind of kindness that Donna is talking about and that you give it. And we will see you walking with a spring in your step tomorrow. Thanks so much. See you soon.